and also waiting around for this session. I hope that it's worth your time, and I really hope that you get as much as you can from this. It's going to be um, a very hands-on session, so I'm going to be providing a lot of uh, details, and then if we have time, I'll jump into a demo. Um, so yeah, let's let's get this started. My name is Aurora, or for the non-English speakers out there, non-Spanish speakers out there, I'll say Aurora. And um, I'm Spanish, and I work for Google. I work in the trust and safety team. And what we do there is we talk to different content creators and website um, owners and creators in order to um, help them improve their, their content and ensure that their websites are secure. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So um, there's a, OK, let's see. There we go. There's a few things that are that I'm going to be going through. First of all, um, the why's and the how uh, websites are being hacked. Um, secondly, I'll be introducing six best pra six six best practices that you can use uh, to improve your website security. And thirdly, I'll jump into a demo. Um, if anything. I would really, really like that when you leave this session, uh, you think about security as your priority. And I'm making it really easy because it rhymes. So you can just remember it like a jingle on TV. Um, and so let's, let's go into website security. Um, why is making website security, why is it so important? Well. In order to reply to this question, we need to understand a few common ideas or myths that are out there and that we first have to bust. So first of all, um, security is not a developer's job. Are there any developers in the room? OK. Uh, probably, I mean, I don't know if, do you think this is something you hear? Do you think, is this something you believe in? Uh, that it's not a developer's yeah. job? So, okay, okay, because we have heard from a lot of developers that they want to um, ensure that their websites um, offer a delightful experience for users and that they are, the websites are fast and they're reliable, but they don't tend to focus as much sometimes, I'm not saying that the people here, but they, sometimes they don't focus as much on security. And as you know, without security, um, you're not making your site um, proper, uh, reliable for your users, so you might lose trust there. So it's something that has to go hand in hand with the development of a website. Um, second common misconception is my website is singled out and actively targeted. Well, many people, many um, website owners think that there are hackers in their basement trying to figure out their, the passwords to their websites. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, there are hackers generally, they are looking for systemic vulnerabilities to websites. And like uh, in, in CMS platforms, in, in third party applications, in plugins. Um, and they're looking for out, that outdated, unpatched version. Not, they don't, they're not really looking for a specific, uh, for a specific website or a specific business necessarily, unless it's huge, of course. Um, so usually how it works is they write a program to scan the web, and they're looking for unsuspecting websites um, that have installed a certain plugin. And once that program comes across the website, um, then it becomes the target. And that's when the, um, the software that they have created breaks into your site and adds the spammy links and stuffs it with keywords. And usually, they take advantage of the fact that you might have a very good reputation of your, on your website or you might have a lot of traffic. So they feed on that. And they take a lot of, they're very, very careful to make sure that you don't notice it. And because they hide all of these, they hide all of these practices. So the, fight, the site might function perfectly well on your site. You might not even notice, but you might have been hacked. So thirdly, um, my website 
does not contain any valuable data, so why am I even here? Like, I'm not even, you know, a target for hackers. You might be. So um, it's not just, as I was saying, it's not the business and it's not personal data. It's, it's more the traffic that you are bringing and the reputation you have on your website. So think, for example, about a site that, um, the site of an ice cream shop in a, in a little town, and it might be the best um, ice cream shop in the whole town. So it has a lot of visits because people visit it as well as the shop. So an attacker might be taking advantage of that reputation uh, to monetize its traffic. So even if that ice cream shop is not asking the users about their personal data, they might still be a target for a hacker. So to summarize, um, we can conclude that security is an essential part of a great web experience. A site isn't necessarily the main target of an attack, and the technical signals matter more than the business itself. Think about it as well like a burglar that goes to a street and is knocking on every single door. The burglar does not know what's behind the doors until a neighbor opens and then they can actually scan the building. Um, this is, the same, this is the, way, the same way that it works with hackers. They create these programs and they scan the web. If your site is not protected, it's really easy for them to get in and see what you have inside. So, make your site like your home, protect it the same way. So what happens if you don't lock your site? Well, some of you might have, might have heard about the Equifax case. It's been pretty big. Um, it's a massive website. Um, who knows Equifax here? You're, you're American? Yeah, okay. Because I didn't know it, but I, yeah, um, I imagine you all did. Um, there's been a massive leak of IDs and driver's license and secure, social security numbers. Um, this is a website that stored a lot of that data and over 145 million users' data is now has been exposed. This is certainly not ideal. And the only reason I'm bringing this example to you is because even the experts, even sites that are fantastic at doing what they do, they can still be vulnerable to leaks. So, um, yeah, you might think maybe my website is smaller and I have nothing to fear. Well, who has heard of the Japanese hack? Yeah, someone there has heard about Japanese hack. Well, a Japanese keyword hack uh, targets, targets sites that have uh, a good reputation in search. This can be a big site or a small site. And the way it works is um, there's pages being created and auto-generating auto Japanese text in randomly created, um, in randomly created um, directories. So what happens is that there's, um, the, the pages are mon being monetized using affiliate links to stores, uh, fake stores. So all of this merchandise is what appears in search. Um, you might have come across it at some point. We tend to be good at removing it really quickly, but of course these things happen and they're very unfortunate. Um, with what this, what this hackers, what these hackers do is they um, they verify themselves as owners in Search Console for certain certain properties. So what I do recommend is if you have Search Console and if you're um, at, you're the the owner of a certain property, and suddenly you see you detect um, a user that is not verified that you or that you don't know of, check it out because that might mean that you've been hacked. And I don't want to scare you with this. <laughs> um, now, everyone here probably has heard about phishing because you're all very technical, yes. Um, but in any case, phishing is a form of social engineering that tries to trick users into um, giving away their personal information. Now, can you tell me, um, well, I've marked it here actually, so it's kind of easier. With, with my initial presentation, had a cool animation there, but okay. So I'm going to show you three aspects of how can we detect uh, phishing in this case. So first of all, you're gonna see that the URL is strange. This is, this is kind of a, a normal um, sign-in page. And 
the, the URL, I don't know if you can see it from there, but it's a, it's a redirect. It's not the google.com uh, normal login, it's a redirect. So that's one thing to watch, watch out for. Secondly, the quality of the image. As you can see, I don't know if you can perceive it very well, but it's very pixeled. Um, it's not the original image. And thirdly, there's a call to action on the, at the bottom, create your own account. That does not exist in the original uh, page. So all of those things are misleading, trying to mislead users into introducing their personal data and hence fish all of their personal information. Um, something that, um, that I, that I do recommend is that you always check all of those all of those points because they're going to hackers are always going to try to make you believe that a site that is common to you and familiar to you um, is is okay when it isn't so that's one thing and another thing is to keep in mind to be aware of emails of the redirect of certain emails and n don't share your personal information over email because um, it might be, always be a reason for phishing. Okay, so is phishing effective? You probably think that, oh, who's going to fall for phishing nowadays? It's pretty obvious. Like what I showed back there, it's pretty obvious that it's quite dodgy, no? Um, but actually, I'm going to show you some numbers um, that are pretty scary. So around 45% of users fall for phishing because phishing can get very, very sophisticated. and 20% of hackers that extract the information check that information after 30 minutes of having fished, fished it. So they're really, really quick. And once they have your information, if you haven't noticed, you're pretty much lost. OK, so what can you do? I'm going to go through some of the six best practices that I was mentioning before, because, yeah, we're here for you. Um, first of all, we talked about the how and why websites are being hacked. Um, it's important to know that um, all of these blocks that you're seeing here are not, should not be considered in isolation, but combined. So this is all a combined effort in order to ensure that your security, uh, your web security is as, as up as, as to points as possible. Um, so first of all, we're gonna go. I'm gonna go through a safer login or two-step verification, um, keeping your systems up to date, uh, implementing HTTPS, verifying your site in Search Console, having a backup, and training your employees. Okay. So first of all, the safer login. Can somebody recognize their password here? Yeah, you're all laughing, but maybe you can, and you're not telling me. <laughs> um, these are, believe it or not, the top, top around top 20 most used passwords in 2017. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, so obviously, these are not very safe passwords, so don't use them. <laughs> um, what I do recommend, and not just me, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, recommends really, really great guidelines uh, in, for, to, to create good, um, not just good passwords, but if you are website owners and developing websites, uh, to ensure that your users are creating good um, passwords for your, to enter your website. So there's two pillars that I want to mention here, uh, the limitations and the resets. First of all, within the password lim limitations, um, forbid the, the use of common terms. So words in the dictionary, uh, sequential um, characters like one, two, three, four, five, six, um, context specific um, words. So if you have a banking, a banking um, website or platform, don't allow your, your users to use something, a term related to banking for their password. Um, and then don't uh, avoid the, the password hints. And the reason why is because a lot of the password hints relate to personal data. And personal data is nowadays very, very available in social media. So 
they will know us very easily. You will know our mother's name, for example, very, very easily. Um, and limit the number of password attempts. Secondly, um, I was mentioning the resets. Actually, it's not a must to have a lot of uh, very frequent uh, password recent, uh, resets because if the, all of the other measures are in place, a good password, there should be a good password uh, generated. However, good passwords are useless if there's phishing. So that is where the two-step verification comes in. Who has heard about two-step verification? I just want to make sure that we're all, oh, actually, yeah. This doesn't usually happen. <laughs> this is great. So um, as you know, two-step verification um, protects your account with, someone, with something you know, a password, and something you have. Could be an external device, or could be something else that I'm going to show you now. So what it does, as you know, it's a second layer of authentication, of protection of your account. Um, and when it is enabled, it is much more difficult for hackers to actually access um, to access your account because, well, they might break through your password, but there's that extra layer there that will make it really, really difficult. And these are the different forms that the two-step verification can take. It can be an SMS message, a call, um, it can be an app, uh, a security key, a uh, second phone or device you might have, a backup code, or, a veri or verified devices. Now, security key, I have mine here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show you. Looks like this. You might have used it before, but just wanted to make sure that you all know how it looks like. And um, I personally use it all the time. Um, I use it for my laptop. Um, not, it's, it's, not, it's not good for mobile because it's, well, it's USB. But it's, it's for the laptop, it doesn't require battery or Wi-Fi, and you just have to touch it, and it's cool. So um, that's, the, that's something you have. It's a physical device, and it is really difficult to break into, into an account if you have a physical device. Um, but if you're not a fan of physical devices, or if you want to do it for your mobile phone, I recommend that you download the Google Authenticator app if you haven't done so already. You can use it across products, and it doesn't require Wi-Fi. Well, yes, when you download it, but no when you want to use it. And what it does, it generates uh, random six-digit codes that, are, that expire every X amount of time. And it's really easy to set up. Um, it's for free, of course, and yeah, it's it's a great way of having a two-step ver two verification on your phone. Do you use it? No? I recommend that you check it out. I, yeah, I recommend that you check it out if you, if you don't use it. Um, so to summarize, uh, two-step verification adds an additional layer of identification uh, to make the authentication process more secure. Now, there is another option, which is login with um, a certain platform or a certain um, software. So for example, uh, it's the single sign-on SSO, and if you're using Twitter, uh, you can do sign up with Twitter, uh, or you can do this with a CMS, you can do it with different platforms, and it's something we recommend as well. So um, not just make, not just have one type of login, but have different types of login with different, different products can diversify the, the, the risk. Okay. Secondly, um, keep your systems up to date. Um, by systems, I mean not just, I mean any, any type of software that you might be using to run your website, um, third party applications as well. An outdated software is like uh, an untied shoelace. Like you can walk with it, but at some point you're going to trip and you might fall. So we really recommend that you update your, your systems. Also, uh, developers out there, uh, we all tie our shoelaces when we leave home, unless we don't do it for a certain fashion, but anyway. Um, so think about um, how your, your website is going to be updating itself when, when you are in the process of creating it, like tying your shoelaces before leaving the house. Um, Okay, so what can you do on, on, as a developer uh, or as a site owner um, to prevent all of, this, all of this? So make sure you're monitoring the website status. 
check the server configuration, and pay attention to the guidelines. We, um, in Google, we have the developers.com.google. Um, it's the developer's guide. Um, it has a lot of different guides that you can use. Um, I don't know if you've used it before, but there's tons of different things of implementation. And uh, we, this year, we, we even added a way of uh, a, a hacked guide. So what uh, a way of um, guiding the, um, the users that have been a victim of, of hacking guiding them through the process of a cleanup. So it's really, really useful. It has videos as well. And yeah, oh, maybe you wanna take a picture? Yeah, you're good? Okay. If, I, if, if at any point you wanna take a picture of a slide that I'm presenting and I'm going too quick, let me know. Um, okay, so as we discussed earlier, a hacker is not really interested in the content of your site, but on your systemic vulnerabilities. So, Updates and patches are super, super important, and they're not effective if you don't install them. So sometimes it really, really helps to enable the auto-updating, um, and this is something that you can do with your hosting provider. Um, but if this is not an option, like we know that WordPress, for example, one of its latest versions broke that auto-updating, um, make sure you're doing it yourself. Okay, so in summary for this block, all systems should be patched and updated regularly and keep your code clean. So if there's something you don't need anymore, remove it. Don't add clutter to your website. Okay, implement HTTPS. Uh, you might have heard a, a lot about HTTPS this summer. Um, it's a mechanism that allows a browser or app to securely connect with a website. So, um, as you as you probably know, HTTPP, which was what everyone used to use, um, it's hypertext transfer protocol, and it allows users uh, to connect web, um, to websites from a browser through browsers. So, what HTTPS does, it it's, it encrypts that that connection, and it secures the, the, the um, it secures the connection in between the users and the website, and that's what you want to do essentially. Um, so nowadays, users are very savvy with this, and they know that if it's HTTPS, it's going to be a secure site, and if it's not, well, they have to be careful. But um, you can always tell them that um, HTTPS HTTP is actually like a postcard that you send and it's completely open and everyone can see it. And HTTPS is like a sealed envelope where no one really can access it unless it's the right person that gets the letter. So why HTTPS? Well, for three different things. Uh, first of all, encryption. Um, as I was saying, the data, it's, it's important to make sure that the data gets to the right person. Um, and we don't want anybody else to listen, listen to the traffic generated so, or steal that data. Um, data integrity, data uh, should not be available to uh, modify or to uh, cor be corrupted. And thirdly, authentication. Um, avoid that man in the middle, get rid of it, um, and ensure you have your user's trust. So have somebody, have you all implemented it? Do you, if you own websites, are you familiar with this? That's fantastic. Actually, um, my team is very, my team is doing this, is, is pushing a lot for this, especially in, in Europe and in Asia, because in America, America is leading. America is leading this HTTPS uh, transition. And especially, um, well, I'll give you some numbers in a second. Uh, but in terms of implementing HTTPS, um, we want to make sure that we have robust security certificates, um, use server side 301 redirects. So when you are redirecting from a HTTP to a HTTPS, that that is well done. Um, the crawling and indexing, so ensuring that Google can find those new, those new HTTPS sites um, and supporting HSTS. Um, this is, I'm guessing that if everyone here is comfortable with HTTPS, kind of lemon pie for everyone. So 
HTTPS enables new web technologies like geolocation or push notifications, um, fast performance, and can actually improve your search ranking. So there's a lot of myths around HTTPS, and that is why people maybe have been delaying the change for a long time, uh, thinking that it's expensive. Well, actually now certificates are for free. There's initiatives like Let's Encrypt that are offering these things for free, and it's amazing. So there's that that doesn't make sense anymore. Um, HTTPS doesn't slow down uh, websites anymore, no. And that was maybe 15 years ago. Um, and it's actually a good sign for ranking. So we're all maybe thinking about SEO at some point. Um, HTTPS is going to be a beneficial, uh, a beneficial uh, sign here. And I was mentioning uh, from a user's perspective, uh, a, lot, a lot has changed on Chrome uh, in the summer. So you, you can see up here how uh, from, it was July this year, we announced that we were going to start marking HTTPS sites as secure um, and non-HTTP, HTTP, HTTP, sorry, <laughs> as, uh, as not secure. So what we're going to start doing very soon is to remove the, the green lock Oh, the, the color green actually, and just make it normal. Because what we want to do is normalize the web. We want the users to know, to feel that the web is safe. And wherever, whenever it's not safe, we will default to not secure. And that's the, that's the, that's the midterm project. So you will see it down here. Um, if you're typing in something, actually you won't. Oh, because I'm, I don't have internet connection in this. Okay, never mind. So imagine you're, you're typing in your email and your password and it says not secure up there. Then what will happen is the not secure will turn into red. So the user will know that it's actually, you know, it, that's a red flag. Don't add your, your, your information there. So in summary, enable HTTPS on all sites and that's it. <laughs> There's no more, no more to that. Um, okay, verify your sites in Search Console. Are we all familiar with Search Console? Who uses it? One, two, three, four. Okay, I'm surprised. Yeah, no, no, I am going to. You use it as well? No, you don't? Okay, I'm very surprised because, yeah. Well, I'm going to go through Search Console. This might be more new, a bit, a bit newer than the HTTPS content. Um, okay, so Search Console is a free and open tool where um, site owners can see, can track everything related to their website. It is really, really easy to use. Um, you just have to verify your website there, and it's a great way of communication with Google. So whenever there is um, uh, an error or a security breach, they will communicate um, that security breach to you through a message or an error warning. So it's a great way of knowing, oh, I've been hacked. This is, this is what I have to do. Um, it's actually what you can see on this column on the, on the right is the, the older version. And we will very, very soon, we're experimenting with the newer version. It's currently in beta. So somebody here might be using the beta already. I don't know. Is someone using the beta? It's, it's quite reduced, but it's, it's coming for everyone very soon. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's a very useful tool. And this might convince you a bit more. So 2016, we discovered 32% more hacked, web um, hacked websites. That's around 800,000 websites. And there are no indicators that this number is going down. So. 61% of webmasters could not be reached because they had not verified their sites on Search Console. So we could not tell them, hey, this is what's going on, and this is how you can do, this is what you can do to fix it. Um, however, among those users that we could actually contact, 84% could actually fix, um, fix the, the, the problem and go through the whole uh, reconsideration process. So. It is something I, we really recommend in Google to check out Search Console because it's, it's just a great, a great way of, of hearing what's going on with your website, um, with Google Search, of course. 
So some of you might have seen at some point that lovely message. Um, I personally manage the, the, um, the forum, the webmaster forum, where we help users. I manage the English and the Spanish forums. And we get a lot of, lot of users who are completely overwhelmed and in despair saying, my site has been hacked and I'm seeing this. Help me get rid of it. Again, we can't do much. Well, we can share a lot of guides and information, but if the user has not got that their site verified in Search Console, we cannot see where the hack has happened or if the hack has happened. Um, so that's what the user sees or what we all see. And this is what the user would see if they had their sites verified in Search Console. So they would receive a message from Google um, acknowledging the infection and uh, sharing the links where the hack has happened. And then some steps to um, clean up that hack. So I think it's a very useful thing. Um, and I recommend everyone to go and check it out. Uh, so yeah, as I said, it's a free, it's a free tool. I'm not pitching it here. I just, <laughs> uh, I honestly don't get um, money from this, but it's, it's genuinely a very good tool um, for everybody who has a website. And you can also check more, more information on the security blog and on the Security Research Center, where we publish news and updates on different features related to Google search. Okay, so it is as important, all of those things I've told you, as important to have a backup. Because in the, situ in the case that a hack happens, you want to make sure that you can get everything back and regain your user's trust once more. So help, help yourself by having a backup and restoring, um, you're restoring your site if, if the worst comes to worst. Um, and finally, train your employees. So if you work in an organization with more people, you have to ensure that you're all on the same page. Um, usually, this is a bit of an, of an elephant in the room because a lot of the hacks and phishing happen because of human error, because there's an employee that opens an email that shouldn't have opened, or because they click on a link that they shouldn't have clicked. So ensure that this, that everybody is trained in the best practices. Um, offer regular trainings and uh, like be understanding, like this can happen to anybody. Um, develop escalation processes and define clear rules and responsibilities within the company. Um, how to install software, where can we install it, um, and so on. And also pay attention to warnings. Like we, we have um, safe browsing guidelines and we have all of those pop-ups. You might have seen them when you're navigating and then you get the red and you're like, okay, I shouldn't, I sh maybe I shouldn't go into this website. Um, we have to ensure that everyone that works with us knows about these, these warnings and takes them seriously. Um, and also um, improve their skills by telling them how to report um, making sure that they're using social media if they're using it at work or with work devices, that they're using it well. Um, if, if they're handling sensitive data, that they know what they can do, what they cannot do. Um, and ensure that they're making uh, backups, periodic, periodic back, backups of the job. And in summary, encourage your employees to, or your colleagues to go ahead and use these, these practices, these healthy practices. Try to do it in a positive way, not in an accusing way, like you are not into security. <laughs> I'm going to put posters all around the office of your face. No, let's just do it in a nice way. Like, let's all do it together. Don't scare them because security can be scary, but it's better to do this in prevention than as a reaction. And you might know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so as I was saying, one of the things that I want, like one thing that I want you to bring home with you is, it rhymes, remember, make security your priority. Um, these, are, these are the blocks that I was talking about. Keep them, use them all together as, as, as different blocks. And 
Yeah, these are some these are some um, links that you might be that you might find useful. There are resources. They're they're um, open for everybody, and they have a lot of information. And if you're interested in learning more about web security, there's. Uh, let me know if I can go to the next slide. Cool. Um, this, for example, is, is a great tool. If you go to support.google.com slash webmasters, that's a great tool. That's a great, great platform where you'll find a ton of resources related to web security. And I can go through a demo now and take the questions at the end, or I can go through some questions now and leave the demo. But I think the demo might be interesting. Yeah. OK. Let me see. OK. OK. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two different ways that um, hackers use to inject um, inject content. So this is um, uh, I'm going to show you first uh, um, an SQL injection. Have you heard about this before? Yeah. No, yeah, no. OK. Um, I hope you haven't been a victim of, of a SQL injection. Um, first of all, I want to say that these vulnerabilities, although we've heard about them and we've seen them, they keep happening. And in 2017, um, there were like 94% of the identified uh, vulnerabilities were related to this that I'm going to show you now. So it's a very simple hack but it's, it happens a lot. So let's see, basic injection. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sign into this website as the admin. So as you can see, it's a cake shop, poor person who just has their own cake shop, and I'm just going to break into it. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to just try and, and, and access in any way. So I'm going to say, um, Password. Well, no, I'm going to call it admin, first of all. Password isn't password. OK, so admin. First of all, I want to know um, if a certain username exists. That's all I want to know for now. So I'm going to see if admin exists. No, so admin doesn't exist. OK, let's see admin one, two, three. One, two, three for whatever exist nope okay so what we can do is we can concatenate vari variables um, a ver, with the sql commanders together so i'm going to inject something that looks okay that looks like this admin so that is that is what i'm guessing that this person will be called. Um, and this I'm going to, this thing I'm showing you is if a website hasn't um, implemented a few of the best practices, this is, it will be really easy to break into, into them with this type of hack. Um, so I say admin and quote, and that quote um, will be supplying a value to the username. So we will do quote, and then we will comment. So saying, basically what we're saying is um, the name is admin and something else. And that's it. Um, and oh, we can actually find the secrets. Easy. And this is, and we can just go in and see that admin existed, admin whatever, we don't care, but something with admin existed. And that's all of the information we, we needed. Too bad. Now we're going to find out what if we don't know? We don't know about this admin. We don't know um, how the how the username looks like. So what we're going to do is we go we're going to create a query that evaluates to true. 
by using an or statement. So we're going to say uh, cake, for example, quote, and we're going to use our or statement, one, and comment it out. And yeah, we can break it easily again. This cake shop really has security issues. OK. And another, another, issue, another issue that we can, that we can detect is, for example, coupons. I don't know if someone here works with a, with a website that generates coupons. But um, it's really easy to actually find out what the coupon is like. And you can get free cake. So we're going to see if we can, we can get free cake. So let's see. OK. So what we can do here is, this is called a blind um, SQL hack. And OK. So what we're going to do is, again, if the page is vulnerable to SQL injection, which we found out that this one is, um, we're going to try to find out the name of the coupon. So what we, we're just going to call it cake, just because. And we're just going to say or one. We're going to use our, the statement we were using before and comment it out. And hooray, we can, access, we can access this. So what if we actually now want to share the coupon with everybody? And uh, we want to just, you know, cake for everybody. So what, we, what we're going to do, oh. OK. If we don't know, if we want to find out exactly what the, what the code is, what the coupon is, because we, I just want to share it with you and you and you and everybody, uh, we, can do it, we can do it two ways. We can do it manually, which is the way I'm going to show you now. Or you can generate a script, which is, would be the easy way. Um, but I'm just going to create, it, create this manually. So let's say cake. And we're going to, let's see, let's see, let's see. Going to say cake. Or coupon, because that's what we want. And then we're going to say, let's say that the first character of this stream is going to be an A, because we're going to do this manually, so we're going to go through the, through the alphabet. Don't worry, I won't keep you here until Z or Z. Um, but let's see. I'm going to copy this, and let's see if it works. No, this one doesn't work. <coughs> let's try with B. You're really fearing that I'm going to make you wait. <coughs> OK. No, B doesn't work. Shall we try C? Let's try C. And it works. OK, so now we know that the first letter of the coupon is C. So the way, the way in which we can, we can go back and start concatenating all of the different letters in the coupon is like this. OK, so we, we will go back. And because we know that the first letter is an A, we're going to change this like this. And we're going to say, So the substream, because we have the initial stream, so the substream of coupon of the coupon is going to be coupon one. That's the first letter that we already have, and we want now the second letter, and that is going to look like C, which was our first letter, and hopefully A. This Let's go, let's start again with the alphabet. And we're going to say comment out. And I'm going to copy this. Oops. OK. OK. Let's see if, let's see if the, sec if the second, second letter is an A. Oh, it's not an A. I think I might have typed something wrong. I think it is an A. 
No, it's an A, I promise. Oh, uh huh, I forgot this. Oh no, okay, it's an A, guys. Because the coupon is gonna be cake something. But um, yeah, so basically, coupon. Okay. There you go. So it's coupon CA. The, the coupon is going to be CA and so on and so forth. You'll be changing all of those numbers. This is an example of how hackers would do it. I mean, of course, they wouldn't go manually doing everything. They write scripts that scrape everything, and it's really easy. Um, but this is essentially what hackers do. They, they, um, they, they just play with, with factors in the, in, the, in the code. So what I'm, going to, what I'm going to say now, just to finish up, I, I want to, because I just scared you with how these people can break into, into accounts, but there's some good practices that I want you to have before I leave. Mm -mm. Okay, so first of all, make sure that you're, um, that you have, para, para, this is a difficult word for me, guys. Paramet, ooh, parameterized, parameterized, is that a good way? Huh? Parameterized. That, that's the word. Um, queries for uh, SQL injection. Uh, ensure that you're sanitizing the user input. Um, and maybe use a templated way uh, to separate the user input from, from the rest. And also use well-known trusted libraries. I mean, it can happen as well that there can be a security breach like what happened to British Airways and they were using a third party library, but um, that's what we recommend and keep everything up to date. So that was all for me. I hope you found this useful and a bit fun. And yeah, I hope you protect your websites really well. Thank you.